welcome to my show. I am with a guest here. His name is Jack Lawrence. Jack Lawrence, how are you doing, sir? I'm good. Thank you for asking. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you very much, sir. Um, firstly, I want you to share, um, share, um, like what, um, your first, um, your best-selling book, um, Blood Turn. Can you tell us something about that book, which was also one of the um, twenty twenty three um, winter um, feast award? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So, Bloodthorn was my first novel that I released um, in April of twenty twenty three. Um, it won the uh, twenty twenty three Fall Book Fest award, and it's also been a, a five time bestseller. Um, and Ingram Spark, which is kind of the, the Amazon equivalent of bookstores. So most book retailers purchase through Ingram Spark, but also individuals can purchase through there. Um, so it, it's been doing pretty well. It's a crime mystery thriller. Um, follows a family therapist who um, his client informs him she's going to divorce her husband and it's a very reliant client. She shows up all the time. If she ever does miss a session, she's uh, very open to communicating with David and lets him know. So when she doesn't show up and nobody hears from her, he feels very nervous about this. There's a lot of anxiety because when she leaves that session after telling him that she's going to ask for a divorce, he, he already feels like something's a little off. Um, so he turns to his best friend who's a homicide detective and he kind of runs a check, a safety check under the radar. Uh, so nobody knows that David has kind of breached confidentiality. And when that doesn't turn anything up, David takes it upon himself to go to Havana, which is a small community in Indiana on the, on the northern end, on the shores of Lake Michigan. And once he's in there, he he unravels a lot of secrets uh, to this gated community that there's a lot more going on than just kind of the rich looking for a getaway. All right, so I want to ask you, what was the what inspired you into writing? What was the thing that first motivates you to go into writing, sir? I've always enjoyed writing. I've always thought it'd be a, a fun thing to do, kind of get the creative outlet going. Um, but then I went to, to school and grad school and started um, working in the field of mental health. And I opened a private practice. And I had been kind of thinking of this idea for Blood Thorn over the course of about four years. I'd even uh, written a few chapters at one point and just set it aside, you know, kind of busy, all my time taking up with family and um, the private practice that I was running. So when I ended up selling the, the private practice, I had a little bit more time on my hands, and I was in a, in a place where I was kind of trying to figure out what the next steps were, if I was going to do something completely different or uh, find a different way to, to practice in the mental health field. And so I sat down and, and started over on the book, and once I wrote it and finished it and decided I was going to put it on Amazon and kind of self-publish it, I reached out to a few bookstores and um, from there it kind of just took off. And it, it was something that I didn't really expect to happen. But when it did, I decided, you know, I really enjoyed the characters. I enjoyed um, learning more about them. And so then I wrote a second one. And then I had an idea for a psychological thriller. And so it's, it's kind of just been um, gaining traction and, and each book has done a little bit better than the one before it. So I've just stuck with that. Um, but I, I do keep my license active in case I ever decide to go back into the, the mental health field. But writing's always been something that I've been interested in. And fortunately I had an opportunity to, to give it a try. All right, thank you very much for that, sir. Sir, please, can you try to describe your write, writing routine? Can you describe how your routine in writing works, sir? So it varies a lot. I don't necessarily have a, 
a real routine. I think the only thing that's really consistent is I ride a few hours every morning, you know, anywhere from one to three hours every single morning. Um, but where I write, you know, that could differ from outside my office, um, at home on the couch, you know, or um, if my kids have an activity and I go to that, I might, you know, write a, a few thousand words there or something. Um, but a lot of times it's when something strikes me and I, and I get an idea, I'll sit down and I'll write it out. Um, and my goal is always about 10,000 words per week. So any way that I can get that done, you know, I, I those couple hours in the morning, I know I'm going to get at least 2,000 words, 3,000 words. Um, I try to set aside at least one day where I can put you know, three or four hours, maybe five hours into just sitting down and focusing and writing. And then from there, I just fill the words, um, get my word count in wherever I can. All right, thank you very much, sir. I would love to ask, sir, what is your process? You know, there are plots of stories. Like, what is your process mm -hmm. of plotting your, um, plotting your story? Like, what, what process do you take to plot your story, sir? Yeah. So I, I'm what I've come to learn is called a, a seat of the pants writer, where I don't really plot a whole lot. Um, for me, I generally come up with a title and then I create the, the story around that title, uh, or it might be the character, you know, I get an idea for a character and then that is the story or, um, if I've been waiting, I just had a dream of the opening scene. And so then the whole story was kind of built on that. Uh, once I write, you know, and kind of the first couple of chapters and I have an idea of you know who the characters are, you know, what the, the main focus of the story is, then generally I'll, I'll let the story tell itself. And I'm, it's kind of like watching a movie in my mind and I'm just relaying what's happening. And if I get to a point where I'm not quite sure where the story is going to go next or, you know, um, there's something specific I want to happen, but I don't know quite how to get there. Uh, at that point, I'll I'll do a little bit of plotting. You know, I'll, I'll figure out what's already happened, where I want it to go, and then what is a, something big that can happen that kind of pushes them, the characters, into that direction. But for the most part, I would say the story tells itself, and then I just relay what's happening. And then through editing and revisions, it you know it cleans it up, makes it more concise, uh, gets there a little bit more cleanly, but I don't do a whole lot of plotting, really. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for that, sir. So I would love to, I would like to have, how do you do your research in your writing project? Like what, how do you research it? Is there any platform you use or something like that, sir? A lot of that really depends on the story. Right, so Bloodthorn, I didn't have to do a whole lot of research for the character because I was a therapist. I knew everything that went into that. I knew, you know, generally how he would think and everything. Uh, the setting was completely fictional and the situation was fictional. And he was, you know, just an, essentially an amateur sleuth kind of trying to, to solve this, this uh, mystery. So I had a lot of freedom there to where most of my research was kind of geared towards the general location of where it was set to make it a little bit more realistic. You know, driving time from Northern Indiana to Chicago, um, the layout of, of Chicago and Northern Indiana. So that was kind of the, the main thing of the research there. Um, then with I've Been Waiting, it was, again, a lot of it was fictional, so it's more regional research of what the layout is, um, you know, kind of how, what the culture is in that area. With Bed of Thorns, again, it was David Thorne, and it was in my, the city that I grew up in, so a lot of that didn't require research, but the, the book I'm writing right now is completely different, where it's, it's a um, procedural, so it's, 
it requires a lot more research and for that a lot of time on google looking at police protocol um, how investigations are handled you know I'm, I'm looking to interview several people in law enforcement to kind of get their take on on the processes and procedures their emotional state working a crime you know how they feel how it wears on them so for me it really depends on the book but a lot of times it's mostly trying to get the region and, and the culture mostly but then if it's something like um, my book, The Consultant, that I'm working on now that requires a lot more uh, in-depth detail Then I will, you know, do interviews or, um, you know, maybe visit the area if I can, if it's reasonable to, to drive there over a weekend to really get a feel of what it's like to be there. Because uh, I think you can do a lot of research, but unless you actually in some way or form put yourself in that situation, whether it's the setting or around the people that are going to be in the book, you know, it's not as authentic. And I think for me, that's, that's the major thing is I want to make sure that I'm, I'm getting that part right. You know, cause you can always touch up, you know, um, all the other stuff, but if you don't get the, the feel, then it's just not going to be the same. All right. Thank you very much for that. Sir. So, you know, there are some, setback and issues like that so i would love to ask like what is the most challenging project so far in your writing career sir yeah so i was, I was saying the the best thing you can do is just sit down and actually write the whatever it is that you're you're planning to write um you know don't worry about getting it perfect or having everything planned out or, or you know what your next steps are going to be just get whatever that story is out onto paper. That's probably the most important thing because once you go through, you know, editing and revisions and you get an in intake from, you know, other people, then the story is going to clean itself up and, and become much better. So the best thing that you can do if you want to be a writer is to just write. All right, sir. So I want to ask you, sir, what do you think continues to keep you motivated to write? You know, there should be something that continues to keep you motivated. What is that thing that continues to make you to be motivated to write, sir? I think there's uh, several things, but I think the, the biggest one is that I just really enjoy it. I love, you know, um, retelling these stories that play out in my mind. I love following the characters as they, you know, solve these, these mysteries or go through the events that they're, they're living through. I think that's probably the, the biggest thing. Um, the second one is that there's no shortage of ideas. I mean, I've, I've always got ideas coming in that I think might make an interesting story. So I, I don't feel like I've ever dealt with writer's block yet. So um, once I sit down to write, I am pretty much writing. Um, and then the, the success that I've um, been fortunate enough to, to experience so far, you know, when people are enjoying the work and there's an award and, and you're seeing your, your name on a bestseller list, you know, there's a lot of motivation there in and of itself that, that you're being validated that the uh, work is good and, and people enjoy it. Uh, but even without all of that, I think just the calmness that I feel when I write and how it kind of takes me away and, and I can just focus on that story and, you know, almost like a, a movie, like I said previously, that I get to watch over and over and um, see for the very first time. So I think if nothing else, that, that alone will keep me writing forever just as a, a form of self-care. All right, thank you very much for that, sir. So I would love to ask, like, what role does do reading play when someone is reading? What role does it play to when someone is writing? Does it help, does more reading help someone to write better or do you think it does not? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think it, it 
it helps tremendously in a lot of different things. Um, you know, if you're reading in, in your genre that you write, then you can learn about structure. You can learn about um, using mystery and, and thriller kind of as an example, since that's what I write. Um, the little subtle hints, you know, how to place an Easter egg so that it can help the reader uh, along the way to try to figure out who did it, you know, see if they can race and beat the, the character who, who's trying to solve it. Um, it shows you character development. What are the things that readers generally like to know about a character? Um, you know, and, and things like that. So I think that really definitely helps um, help forge your writing ability, just seeing how uh, bigger books are written and what makes them work. So um, for me, I, I try to read mostly outside of my genre so that I'm not ever influenced, but I do like to read a few authors within the, the crime fiction world, I guess, so that I can uh, kind of see, you know, those things. Um, what are the, the ways they build their characters and what are the little Easter eggs and hints that they give throughout, you know, more so like, is it the first third of the book? Is it after a certain reveal? Just so that I can kind of see how it aligns with mine. Um, and if I'm putting in too many clues or not enough clues, things like that. All right, thank you very much for that, sir. Sir, you know, there are a lot of criticism, no matter how someone writes books, something like that. So I would love to ask, how do you deal with criticism of your work? Like, how do you deal with criticism, sir? I embrace it fully. Um, and I think a big part of that is I've gotten enough praise to know that my work is decent, right? It's, it's not horrible. But I'm also um, fully aware that I'm really only a year into writing books. I'm, I'm not Stephen King. I'm not, you know, James Patterson. Um, there's a lot that I can learn from. I know for sure that there's a lot of ways that I can grow. I mean, even looking back to Bloodthorn, the first book I released, it's a, it's a five-time bestseller and an award winner, but there's still things that I know I could have done better. And so criticism to me is a way for me to figure out what those things are, right? Because when you're completely um, involved in the work, a lot of times it's hard to see those things. So when somebody tells me I could work on, um, I don't know, uh, plotting, or I could work on um, maybe a, a few more clues in a book to help the reader figure out who the bad guy is earlier, or make it not such a, a big revelation, you know, then those are things that I, I want to work on. Um, but so far, there hasn't been a, a whole lot of criticism, because I generally, before it ever reaches the world, I have alpha readers and beta readers who tell me the things that they think the book needs work on. So those things are corrected before you know it, it ever reaches the market. Um, but again, if if there is criticism, I embrace it because it, it's going to help me grow. It's going to help me be a better writer. And um, to me, criticism is is a great learning tool. Um, as long as it's not just an attempt to break somebody down, right? Because there is that difference between somebody telling you where something needs work and then something you know, somebody saying just to, to try to build themselves up. And fortunately, my, my time in the therapy field and working in mental health, I've been able to distance myself and disconnect enough that I can tell the difference when that is. Um, but yeah, I think if you, if you struggle with criticism, that's a big thing to work on because at the end of the day, that's the thing that's going to help you grow and learn the most. Um, it's people telling you what could be better. So don't take it personal. Take it as a, a big learning opportunity. All right, sir. Thank you very much. So I would love to know 
what your you know what your goals are you know as a writer what are your goals what are your future say like what do you see in the future and what are your goals for as a writer sir yeah so when i first wrote bloodborne my only goal was to be able to say i wrote a book um and to have one person buy it and tell me that it was okay right and so to go from that to within a year having won an award and four consecutive bestsellers it's really ramped i guess my my goals up a lot to where now one of my big goals is to have a publisher um partially because it takes out a lot of the headache right i mean right now as an independent writer everything falls on me so I would like to, to have a publisher so that my main responsibility is just writing, right? I don't have to deal with everything else that comes along with it. Um, and also uh, with a publisher, it makes it a lot easier, I think, to get into some bookstores and have events just because it, it, it puts something behind your, your name and your work that gives it a little bit more credibility. So I think right now that's probably my, my primary goal is to have a publisher, whether that's a, a small publishing house or an independent publisher. Um, and that's where it's kind of gone to now, just from how far it's come in the last year. All right, sir. I would like to ask, as an independent writer, what do you think is the best way someone could, you know, market is or a book? What is the best way? You, what idea can you say that? This is the best way you can market your book to the audience. Sir. So my philosophy is quite a bit different than probably the general consensus, which is you got to be on social media and do reels and everything else. And I think that's important. But I think for me, a lot of my success has actually been old fashioned, hitting the pavement type of marketing, right? Giving out bookmarks, leaving free books kind of wherever I'm at. Um, and especially connecting with bookstores and libraries, right? If I can get my books into a bookstore or a library, that greatly expands how many people are gonna get my book. Um, and I think social media and, and the internet has become such a big part of our lives that we feel that runs everything. But when you stop and you talk to somebody about your work, you give them a bookmark, you, you know, talk to them about themselves, get to know them a little bit. What are their likes? What kind of books interest them? And how, how does your book feed into that? Um, it builds a connection and it builds some sort of uh, relationship, even if you never see that person again. So for me, my biggest success in marketing and, and promotion has just been getting out there and talking to people and not as much social media, although I do obviously run ads and things like that. I think building relationships with people that I come in contact with is probably the biggest thing. All right, thank you very much for that, sir. Sir, I would like to ask generally, what advice can you give to the audience generally? Generally is do what makes you happy. Right? Um, a lot of people are, are stuck in trying to fit into some sort of box or construct that they feel society has or a blueprint that's kind of been laid out to what happiness looks like, but that might not be what works for you. And so I think it's super important to kind of figure out what happiness actually looks like to you. How would you know if you were completely happy? And then do whatever is gonna get you there. Right. And, and if that's running your own business, you know, an hour a night, like I said, I, I write a couple hours in the morning because that's the easiest for me. Um, so if your goal is to open a business, you don't have to dedicate 80 hours a week to it. dedicate an hour a day, you know, 20 minutes a day and build up to where it can be a full time thing. But definitely with everything that you have chase what makes you happy and, and do things that fulfill that over you know a blueprint 
that isn't geared towards you. All right, thank you very much, sir. I would like to ask lastly, mm -hmm. if there is anything you would love to inherit from the forefathers, the ancestors, something that is from the past that you would love to bring back to the world we are today, what do you think the thing would be, sir? It's a community. Um, helping your neighbors, caring more about others than our, ourselves. Right and um, actually having general genuine connections with people, to where when we're out, our face isn't buried in a phone. It's not on a device, but we're communicating and, and seeing the world that is actually around us, and not you know kind of that make believe world that's pushed out onto to the devices. Uh, you know, so I think that would probably be the the big thing is bring that connection. All right, uh, Mr. Jack Lawrence, I want to appreciate you for the little time, despite the ups and downs that was, you know, happening. Thank you very much for standing and sticking to the conversation. I want to say thank you very much, sir. Thank you. I had a lot of fun. I appreciate you having me on. All right. So have a wonderful day, sir. Bye. Thank you. You as well.